Welcome, I'm Jennifer Stein with Prevent Child Abuse Habersham's Partner in Prevention Program with a special edition this month. April is National Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. And to help bring greater awareness and understanding to the importance of prevention programs for child maltreatment, we have a group of special guests that will be joining me this morning. We also would like to share with you an upcoming event we have planned for the entire community. Pinwheels for Prevention Awareness Day, which will be held on Saturday, April 12th at Wilbanks Middle School. This will be an exciting day as we celebrate youth in our county with the goal of preserving their childhood. This day we'll be having a public race, kickball tournaments, kids activities, inflatable, all while learning more about child resources available here in Habersham County. Best of all, these kids' activities, they're free. So we really want you to come out and just enjoy the day. But first, I would like to welcome some very special people that help child and children here in Habersham find their voice when these children have fallen through the cracks of our system and have suffered from child maltreatment. These guests know firsthand and understand how important it is that we continue to educate and provide prevention programs to help end child abuse. And so with me today, I'd like to introduce to you um, our special guest, Steve Collins. He is from Adults Protecting Children, the president of that company. Mark Smith, director of the Powerhouse for Kids. We have Richard Stein. He's sergeant for the Special Victims Unit of uh, Habersham County Sheriff's Department. Shannon Williams, Williams' son, excuse me, Shannon. Um, he is the, and I want to get this right because many of us just say defects, but Shannon is the Social Services Supervisor for Habersham County in the Division of Family and Children's Services, That's and they right. play a very special role for us here. Uh, and then here we have Nadine Scott. She is the forensic interview for the Powerhouse for Kids. And so I want to thank each of you for being here today. Um, first, Richard, uh, I'd like to speak with you and, and help share with Habersham County. This past fall, the Sheriff's Department has taken over in the school system uh, by providing school resource officers. How is that going for the Sheriff's Department? Uh, excellent. Uh, it's been going uh, very well. Uh, Sheriff Terrell uh, took over uh, the school system as far as policing uh, last fall and has implemented uh, a great program, uh, very proactive. Uh, we have a total of four uh, SRO officers, uh, school resource officers, um, Jamie Carver, Marie Taylor, Marsha Brock, and Patrick Mayfield. Uh, they are covering 15 schools, and we have uh, just under uh, 6,500 kids. So, Richard, what would be the process if um, somebody within the school system uh, had a concern that there was a child abuse case? What, what do they do? Uh, basically, it starts off uh, with the counselors, um, or it, it depends on how the disclosure came out. Um, most of the time, it, it may be a teacher um, that the student has said something to, and then uh, they'll let the counselor know, and then uh, from there it goes to the school uh, resource officer. And then from there, they contact myself or Heidi Venable with the Special Victims Unit. Uh, we then meet uh, with uh, the teacher, counselor, and discuss uh, what the disclosure was, uh, depending upon if it's physical, sexual abuse, or sometimes there are neglect issues. Uh, from there, um, a referral is made to the Department of Family and Children's Services um, and we also contact them individually. Um, we usually then meet, uh, discuss the situation, and then depending upon uh, what level it is, assess on whether or not uh, that case will be brought down to the powerhouse. Um, after that point, if, if it does go to the powerhouse, uh, we all meet at the powerhouse and, and start there. But the main thing is, and what's worked very well this year, and Sheriff Terrell has been very proactive on is we've got a great relationship with the school system and with the administrators. Um, the social workers have been extremely helpful with us this year uh, since this is our first year. Um, the counselors have been great and all of our uh, SROs have gone out there 
and have really fostered and build relationships with not only the kids in, in a role model position, but have also built relationships with the administrators and with the counselors so when there is a problem, we can act quickly and, and um, hopefully uh, fix it or take some sort of action. Well, it's always good to hear, too. I know they've had some nice articles in the Northeast Georgian lately uh, highlighting these relationships that the school resource officers are building, um, whether it's having lunch with them, uh, just being available on campus on a regular basis uh, just allows them to see them as a, a friend and somebody that they can go to. Um, you, know, you mentioned uh, the relationship and the collaboration that you have uh, with a powerhouse for kids uh, and DFACs. How beneficial is that for the child and, and for working together for solutions? How, important, how beneficial is that relationship? Uh, it's extremely beneficial. Uh, without it, um, our success rate would, would not be as good. Um, uh, we really um, are dependent uh, on the powerhouse. We're dependent on our relationship with DFACS and working together um, because these are some of the most complex cases that you'll ever work. Um, they're, they're often difficult, um, sometimes historical, and um, when you, anytime that you deal with uh, children, uh, emotions run very high. And uh, we do our best, and we each have a role. We may not always agree, but we always do our best and work together because everybody um, present, including the school, all cares about one thing, and that's the child's well-being. Uh, so that's, that's it. Without um, DFAX's uh, help, or without even the school's help and the counselors on the front line, um, I don't think our success rate would be nearly as good because it's that initial preliminary investigation and with the, and with the school and with DFAX and then bringing it down to the powerhouse, how instrumental they are um, in uh, collecting the uh, evidence forensic interviews and everything else. Without all that, um, uh, we, we, we definitely would have a very, very difficult time. We are fortunate, and uh, you mentioned the school system as a whole. It's encouraging. Matthew, Matthew Cooper, the superintendent, is a, a huge supporter of Prevent Child Abuse Habersham. Uh, and then Will Banks Middle School, uh, the principal there, Ms. Thomas, allowing us to use uh, Will Banks Middle School for our upcoming Pinwheels for Prevention Awareness Day on April 12th. So we are very fortunate in this community that we do, uh, do all put the child first. Um, Shannon, from your experience, uh, what do you find is possibly the biggest misconception that the public has about the Georgia Department of Family and Children's Services? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> I think there are many, but uh, one that really comes to mind is that um, um, I think the community thinks that we're, our focus is on uh, removing kids, and that's, that's, that's the furthest from the truth that we can get. Um, are there times that um, it's necessary to place a kid somewhere that they can be safe and protected for, for, a, minute, for a while? Uh, yes, we do have times like those. Um, but we are, our focus is to keep the family together. You know, after assessing, assessing after investigating, um, if it's necessary to put in services to ensure that that child is safe from abuse and neglect in that home, then that's what we do. And um, then we just, you know, continue to try to just keep, keep that family unit, you know, together. And I would imagine when you are all working together and, and brainstorming, um, what is it called when you're coming up with uh, a, a plan for the, the child? Is it called a safety plan to provide for their care? Yes, at times, yes, at times um, yeah, it is necessary to use safety plans. And then uh, at other times we have, you know, willing and uh, available relatives who step in and um, we are so grateful for those relatives. You know, we uh, assess their homes to ensure that it's appropriate for the child to remain there while we work with the family or the parents to um, eradicate whatever situation that's there. 
It's important, you know, you, you mentioned, Richard, um, how the, the complex nature of each case um, and how each case, everyone, is, is so different. Um, I would imagine that uh, it, it takes time to come up with solutions and come up with answers uh, and you're, you're working together. Um, we, uh, we appreciate that. Um, if somebody were watching today and they were wondering what they could do, how could they be helpful for these children um, that have, um, have suffered from abuse um, or need to be taken out of their home? What could they do to help? Well, we, uh, we're in definitely need of um, foster parents, um, foster and adoptive parents, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a local number they can call. Um, let me just yes. What would that let be? Let me just get that number. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I want to make sure I would, you know, quote it correctly. So, Absolutely. Um, but our local number um, you can call is the uh, seven zero six seven five four zero three seven one. Zero three seven one. Yes, Very good. that. And then there's a, a, a statewide number you can call as well for information regarding adoption or fostering. And that number is one actually one eight seven seven two one zero five four three seven. Very good. All right. The one eight hundred number I was mentioning, I was about to mention, is the one eight hundred for to call for child abuse and neglect. And that number is one eight five five four two two four four five three. Very good. So. And we'll have those numbers available for you at the end of the show, uh, so that way you can have those. Um, Shannon and, and Richard, thank you. Thank you for what you do as a partner in prevention. Um, when we get back from break, uh, we're going to be talking with Nadine and Mark from the Powerhouse for Kids and learn just a little bit more uh, in depth as how important it is uh, to have a child advocacy center and how fortunate Habersham County is to have one so close to home. Thank you. We're an internet that's faster than kids eating their vegetables so they can have dessert provider. Get Windstream's fastest internet speed for one low price. We're a watch in this room, that room, or any room provider. Whole Home Entertainment, powered by Windstream High Speed Internet. Average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Welcome back to Prevent Child Abuse Habersham's Partner in Prevention Program. Today, and through the month of April, we are celebrating because April is National Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. So this program is dedicated to the special people that work in helping a child find its voice. Um, this segment, we're going to be talking with Mark Smith, the director of the Powerhouse for Kids, and Nadine Scott, who is a forensic interviewer uh, for the Powerhouse for Kids. And while we were in our earlier segment, Sergeant Richard Stein with the Special Victims Unit, he talked about during that process uh, of when a child abuse call comes in and, and they're working through learning the details, that at a point it could be that a, an appointment is made at the Powerhouse for Kids. Can you help explain to us, um, share with us exactly what the Powerhouse for Kids is and, and you know who it serves? 
We are, the Powerhouse for Kids is a child advocacy center, and the, our mission is to provide a child-friendly environment for a child to reduce trauma from the um, system that's really set up to protect them. Um, we offer the forensic interviews, the forensic medical exams, as well as advocacy for the family and the child throughout the investigative process and through their um, services maybe that they would be receiving from the Department of Family and Children's Services. We also offer, um, th we have three therapists on staff that provide trauma-focused therapy for families after the initial crisis that brings them to the center. The Powerhouse for Kids serves Habersham, Stevens, and Raven counties, which is um, what we are considered as the Mount Judicial Circuit. Okay. So then what would be the range of ages of children that you might see? We have seen children from newborn to the ages of 18, depending on, you know, what, like I said, we have um, forensic medical exams, so sometimes, especially with a small child, like an infant or a toddler, that might be you know, what we offer for them or what the investigation might ask um, for us to have or a service for us to provide. We do have a sexual assault grant, so we also see adults and um, older victims as well. So there's really not an age that we stop. There's not a time that we get the call and we say, well, we don't, we don't serve that population or that age. Wow, okay. You know, I'd like to add that probably the beauty of the Powerhouse for Kids is that it gives the child the opportunity to tell their story only once. So they're not re-traumatized by telling it first at defects and then perhaps going over to the police department then telling it or being in an emergency room at a hospital and talking to the doctor. Right. By having the center, the child comes and just has to tell the story once. They only have to relive what they got into one time. And all the rest of the people come are part of what we call a multidisciplinary team. It's an MDT approach so that the people come and come to the child as opposed to the child having to go from place to place to place. And so that's the beauty of it, it making it so much easier for the child to be able to relate if something happened to them. And I was, um, it was interesting, it was nice, she gave me a, a tour a while back uh, and it's comforting to see that when a family arrives, it really does look and, and feel like a home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the family room and, and you've got, uh, you know, toys for the children mm -hmm. while they're in the waiting room. Um, and, and just the setup itself is, is just very warm and friendly. Uh, and I think that's something that would not be accomplished if a child had to go to a hospital. Right. Um, that's part of the idea. It's yeah. It is. It really, uh, I could see where it'd be uh, yeah. uplifting. Um, at a difficult time. Now you mentioned this M Mountain Judicial Circuit mm -hmm. and so we are one of three counties. What would you say um, as far as you know how often would you be supporting cases here in, in Habersham County that we refer to you? Oh I can take that easily. Okay. Uh, Habersham County is the most population of any of the three counties that we serve and out of all the cases that we have done in the last few years Probably Habersham County amounts for when you say 45 percent. 45 to 50. Yeah, 45 to 50 percent of the total casework that we do uh, at the powerhouse. Yeah, it's it's very important. And there again, to not have to travel, because how many advocacy houses are there in the state of Georgia? There's 26, I believe. So tw yes. We're a huge so, state. We are. Uh, right. So to not have to, to have this pretty much in our, our backyard in, in Tacoa right. is a is a wonderful benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, for our families and, and for uh, to allow us to prosecute prosecute cases more thoroughly. Correct. Right. Right. And we are, um, and there are other child advocacy centers. Not all of them have a medical component like we do. A lot of times families still might have to go to a clinic or a hospital, okay. but we have everything on site. When law enforcement makes the appointment, the whole team shows up, as Mark said, mm -hmm. and sh they show up with the family. And so everything just gets done right there and they they become very comfortable and the child knows when later when they come for therapy it's still the same environment so it's great for us to be able to offer that medical component on site now this multidisciplinary team who would be a part of that 
that is the powerhouse for kids, and it would be the forensic interviewer and the advocate. The, we have the medical providers. We have two nurse practitioners who from the Tacoma Clinic who do our exams on the children, and we also have some adult sexual assault nurses that are local. Um, so their part, that medical component or representative would be it there. Law enforcement, the Department of Family and Children's Services, sometimes the school resource officers are also there. And the... Um, the, po the point or the reason and the purpose behind a multidisciplinary team is so that it's a group of people um, making a joint effort for these children and not one agency having to stand alone on any decision that's made. Very special group of people. And so that's that collaboration yes. um, that I keep hearing about uh, and is, is reassuring to hear. Um, what would you say as far as, uh, you know, of course, every case is, is so different. Um, and you mentioned some of the, the services that were available uh, that provides that you provide to the victims and families. Um, was there also after, you know, after the plan is in place and such, what are some services that children would or, or people would come back to to seek? Well, the children can come back for therapy. We have, like okay. I said, we have three therapists that um, are on site. And that is another thing that we offer um, for the child or the entire family. Sometimes um, the caregiver might have that story in his or her past. And so we offer services to the caregiver as well um, in addition to the child. An advocate is your advocate from the day you walk through the door till forever. I mean, if your case ended in five years later, you needed someone to talk to or you needed um, a resource or a reference for another resource. You've always got your advocate. The advocates uh, accompany the families to court and kind of help them, guide them, process. and walk them through that process. Wow. Um, with that, as far as um, funding um, for this, does somebody have to worry about qualifying, you know, with their insurance or through Medicare or Medicaid or things like that? I mean, how does how does that work? How does I'll the take power the funding issue. There you go. Yeah, the director of the powerhouse. Uh, all go. the that services works. that we provide at the powerhouse, whether it's the original intake, the intake, the forensic medical, the interview, uh, the trauma focused therapy, everything that we offer is totally free. We don't charge for that. That's a service that we provide to the community. And we get our funding from several different ways. Obviously, we have government grants and programs that we deal with. Nadine mentioned earlier the SA grant for sexual assault. That's one of the programs that we have that helps fund some of the services that we do. But it doesn't cover everything. I would say that probably government funding right now, grants and aids, runs about 40% of the total uh, revenue that we need to keep going. So we have to depend on local fundraisers, okay. uh, local people who feel like that the work that we do is important enough that they want to see that it continue on. So we have a lot of different type of, of, of ways of raising public funds uh, versus the government funds. So it's probably about a 40-60% a split, 40% from uh, government type funding issues and 60 coming from various other ways. But back to the question, everything is totally free. It doesn't make any difference if you have money or don't have money. We want that service to be taken care of because the idea is to take care of the child. And that's the so child important. is foremost in what we do. Um, the cost of therapy alone um, at special group rates runs around $65 an hour, and we will spend well over $100,000 in just a year alone providing just that type of, of traumatic focus therapy for the children or the family or for the various caregivers that we need to help. And, and our uh, commitment is that forget the funding issue in terms of the service that we offer to families and to our clients. That's what comes first. We'll make the funding come. Very important because the lasting impact uh, right. that... Well, awareness is one of the biggest things. It does. Hopefully this program will be a good thing for awareness also. I agree. Yeah. Um, now, when you're working with families, especially as the interviewer, mm -hmm. um, you're hearing different stories. Um, when you look at this, the overall uh, complex issues, what would be the one thing that possibly a community or an individual um, could do to, to help themselves? Could, is there anything there that you could, you could share? From as far as like this the stories themselves or what people can do. I believe that every case that I, that comes to the center or every story that 
I'm told, or every um, voice that comes into that building, um, I 100% believe could have been prevented. I, could have, I believe that that day could have been prevented, that moment, and the fact the child ever had to walk through our doors, all of that could have been that. prevented. So creating this um, the importance, this greater awareness, uh, educating us that maybe have mm -hmm. uh, not gone through this, but by this, we can as a community come together and help oh, transform and, and create absolutely. change. Right. Um, so we look at the powerhouse's two sides. We've got the client coming in and that's the crisis. And that's what we've talked about up until now. But the other side is prevention. And if we can help educate the community so that they don't put a child in a uh, situation where they could become vulnerable, or if the community can learn the signs of, of child abuse so that they're able to recognize and perhaps help prevent part of it also, right. that's part of what we do too. And I think you're going to be talking with Steve Collins in just a few moments. Yes. And Steve's fantastic. Uh, he deals with uh, Darkness to Light, and we've talked earlier about Stewards of Children, which is a program that was put together by Darkness to Light. Nadine and I are both trained facilitators in this particular program, and we spend a lot of time lately uh, out in the community talking with various groups and so forth and, and trying to get people to go through the program. Um, it's very, very important that we raise awareness so that we don't continue to create situations where a child could become vulnerable. Right. So Steve, got, I'm sure, a lot of great things to tell you about he that, but that's an important part of what we do too. Do. Prevention is just as important. In a quick overview of the Stewards of Children program, mm -hmm. what would some, someone walk away with, uh, what knowledge would they walk away with by taking that training? You want to go or you want me? Yeah, you're right. uh, What they're going to walk away with is, number one, how to recognize a situation where a child could be vulnerable, how to prevent that situation where it's vulnerable, how to gain the facts to know what's happening, and then how to react responsibly. It's very important that the way that we react to uh, a child's sexual abuse situation is one that is one that doesn't harm the child, that it gets everything rolling the way that it needs to be, and that you let the forensic interviewer be the one who actually gets the information out in a way that it can be used with law enforcement. That's very, very important as it goes forward. So then so. It's, it's up to us, each and every <coughs> one of us, uh, because once we contribute and take on our role, we then get these families uh, and these children to this wonderful team that helps our kids here. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, and as this overall awareness, uh, it also can kind of push and prevent um, right. the, the maltreatment. Absolutely. As of July the 1st, 2012, everyone in the state of Georgia who works with children in any way, whether you're a classroom teacher, whether you work with children in a daycare center, whether you work with your church or anything else, you became a mandated reporter. And there's specific rules and regulations. And if you don't follow that and you don't make a report when you know that that's out there, then you've committed a crime. Right. And so we need to know that. We need to know how to react to that. that. The Stewards of Training Program will help you understand and know what you do in those situations. Very good. We're fortunate Prevent Child Abuse Habersham does offer in one of its programs the Stewards of Children uh, training program. Um, we're going to be hearing more with Steve Collins in just a little bit about the initiative that Habersham County has. Last year, we trained all certified personnel uh, within the school system of Habersham County, but now we'd like to take this initiative further to reach out beyond educators and to help each one of us learn how to be advocates for the children. Mark, Nadine, thank you for thank what you. you do. You're very special people. We appreciate you, and we're so fortunate to have the relationship that we do with you uh, in this fight and as partners in prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Hear from your doctors at Chester T Regional Hospital. Any community that's growing like this community is needs a good medical facility uh, for people to go to. We have an exceptional level of medical and surgical proficiencies in the area. 
you're going to get the same care here you would anywhere in the country. Chesity does offer a very personal touch, and I think that's one of the greatest assets of the hospital. And it should be supported to help keep the community going. Mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please.